All right, we're ready to go. We've done Genesis. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter one, Exodus. I realize that we spent a fair amount of time in Genesis and uh, I'm intending to do the same in Exodus. Uh, I've told you, but if you're new with us, let me tell you, tell you quickly. Uh, We are just hitting the highlights this time, but Genesis and Exodus are crucial to understanding uh, Jewish theology, the Jews understanding of God. Uh, we have a rabbi coming to do our Barton Clinton Gordy, Gordy series this year. We've had three and they've all been wonderful. And so we have a, a fourth one coming. And the rabbis will be very clear with you that they believe the clearest revealer of God ever was Moses and that era of Moses. Uh, what took place in the life and time of Moses. So this is this is crucial. If if you can deal faithfully and intellectually with Genesis and Exodus, you really have a hold on Jewish theology. You really do. You understand the basic import of the 39 scrolls that we call the Old Testament. Now, we will deal with other passages, of course, but we are going to spend more time with Genesis and Exodus because they are so crucial. Uh, The first five scrolls were the most important uh, to the Jews in in all of their 39. First five were the most important. And of those five, the first two are the most important. They are. So that's why we've spent as much time as we have. It's important that you understand these ancient stories of the Jews. Uh, Other other ancient people have stories about their beginnings, and you understand those people by the stories that they've told and retold and retold. And these are those ancient stories. Uh, when we began this third trip through the Bible, we, we began with the sources of the Torah, uh, J E D N P. And if you missed all that, we're not going to redo that now. But simply to say that we know that for about 800 years, eight hundred years, the Jews told their stories around campfires. After the time of King David, uh, probably just about at that point where Solomon was completing the temple in Jerusalem and they had an educated priesthood, uh, then things started getting written down. But we still don't have anything written by Jews at the time of David, but shortly thereafter, at the time of Solomon. So, The stories told around northern campfires, ten northern tribes, southern campfires, two tribes uh, finally got meshed, J and E. And then later you had the priest contribution and they had the Deuteronomist contribution. But we are going to spend more time in these first two scrolls than we will in the next 37 of the Hebrew scrolls because they are so important to understanding what Jews believe about God. And, of course, that... That community produced Jesus of Nazareth and uh, the God who sent Jesus of Nazareth is Israel's God for sure. So we need to know how the Jews come to their understanding of God. Let's pray. God, we turn our attention now to this all important book of yours and seek your guidance and direction. Uh, We thank you for finding persons who were willing to let you work in their hearts and their minds and their lives and that their stories then were told and told and finally written down and then preserved over all these centuries. Uh, We know there are people who have literally risked their lives, some who have lost their lives trying to look after these holy writings and people who still give lifetimes trying to understand these writings or how to translate them into various languages in the world. Uh, We thank you for your book and pray that you will help us understand it. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, let's go a quick review before we go on to Exodus. I told you that everything before Abraham and Sarah, the Jews consider prehistory for them. Prehistory. The history began for them as a separate people with Abraham and Sarah. And scholars date Abraham and Sarah to about 1800 before the Common Era. I've told you if you want to have a sort of simplified handle on the history of the Jewish people, then it, it can be done in blocks of 200, 400, 200, 400. Okay. 
200 years of Abraham and Sarah and immediately following are called the age of the patriarchs. So you have the stories of Abraham and Sarah, their son Isaac and his wife uh, Rebecca. And then you have the twin sons, Jacob and Esau. Uh, and from from Jacob, then, of course, 12 sons. Uh, Leah bore six of them. Her hen, the handmaid of, of Rachel, too, handmaid of Leah, too. And then Rachel herself finally had Joseph and Benjamin. So 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, and then they followed through Joseph. The other 11 become important. But Joseph is the most important of the 12. And we will follow his fortunes and already have now in more in more detail. Uh, but that whole period of Abraham and, and, and his wife, those four generations, about 200 years. So in 1600, roughly 1600 uh, slavery in Egypt. And that slavery continued, we believe, for the 400 years. That it was roughly the year 1200 uh, when Ramses II was the king, the Pharaoh in Egypt, uh, that Moses comes onto the scene. And from Moses and the, the people who follow him, Joshua and his successors, are 200 years then that we call the time of the judges. And we'll get to all this later, the time of the judges. And after 200 years of living as a loose amphictyony, sociologists call it, a loose confederation of tribes, they decided we need a king like everybody else. And so they began a monarchy of Saul, then David, Solomon, Rehoboam, and so on. 400 years of the kings, and then the Babylonians destroyed the Davidic kingship. Okay. 200 years patriarchs, 400 years slavery, 200 years judges, 400 years kings. All right. OK. We're at that point then about uh, 1200, roughly uh, 400 years have passed from Joseph until the beginning of Exodus here. Verse eight is where we're going to start. Now, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, uh, he means the Egyptians, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Is this a problem of only uh, 3,200 years ago? Not at all. It is a problem in country after country today. Um, if you are Anglo, uh, your days as a majority in the United States are numbered. Uh, this past Wednesday, Thursday, we had uh, pastors from some of the biggest Methodist churches in the country come to Tulsa. I was their host over at the Ambassador Hotel, and we were talking about various Things happening to us. One of them, pastor of First United Methodist Church in McAllen, Texas. His predecessor, uh, Dr. Robert Schnazy, was elected a bishop and for six years now has been bishop of the state of Missouri. He did wonderful things there, relocated the church from an old, uh, devastated part of downtown out onto a new 17 acre campus and so on. You know how many Hispanics live in McAllen, Texas? 90%. Ninety percent of the people who live in McAllen, Texas, are Hispanic. And that just, you know, gradually a little bit smaller percent. But when you get on up to San Antonio, they're the majority now and move community by community. They are majority. So this is a problem. Last May, when Gail and I were in Germany, three weeks Switzerland the last few days, but the biggest part of it in Germany. You know what happened? They brought Turks into their country to do the grunt work they didn't want to do. And the Turks made babies and babies and more babies. And now the Germans are getting very concerned about that. We were in the Netherlands three weeks, uh, about four years ago, and they brought people from northernmost Africa to do their grunt work that they didn't want to do anymore. They're all Muslims. 
And so now these people from northernmost Africa are making more and more babies than the rest of the Netherlanders are. More babies than the Germans are. The Turks are making more babies and so on. And so they're concerned, very much concerned. In Switzerland, they recently had a big election in that beautiful little country. Would they allow minarets in their country or not? The vote was no, they wouldn't. But there are enough Muslims in Switzerland, too, for the same reasons. They came as poorer people, as less educated people. Those who first came. Um, and now they are benefiting from Western education and moving up the socioeconomic level. And it was interesting in Germany when Gail's grandparents came from Sicily to this country. Her grandfather uh, first supported himself on the railroad in Pennsylvania, and then heard he could get paid for what he could produce if he went south to Louisiana and cut sugar cane. He went south to Louisiana and cut sugar cane in the swamps down there with tarantulas and water moccasins cutting sugar cane with a machete, but you know what his dream was? To have his own store. To have his own store. And he started with a little tiny grocery store and then gradually had bigger and better as time went on. Well, guess what in Germany? Uh, late afternoons, you know, when Gail and I would have put in a hard day, we were visiting the concentration camps and so on, as you know, uh, we'd get back to the hotel and uh, I would start looking for us something to drink. Well, you can pay the hotel and a Coca-Cola is four dollars, you know, or I can walk right down from the hotel a block and find one of these little Turkish hole in the walls and I could buy a two liter Coke for 75 cents. So I walk, you know, I walk and I buy from these Turks. But guess what? They're becoming entrepreneurs. Just like Gail's granddad did when they came from Sicily. They're becoming entrepreneurs. Uh, they, they don't intend to clean your commodes for the rest of their lives. And if they have to, then they don't intend for their children to do that or their grandchildren to do that. All I'm saying is this is a recurring problem. And the Egyptians are saying, look at these slaves we've had all these years. They're out breeding us. What are we going to do? Verse 11. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Python and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. So when that didn't succeed in uh, reducing their numbers, the next plot, verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, I want you to notice here how expensive writing material was, how there's usually an effort to conserve words, how there have been a number of important people mentioned here, even the king of Egypt. We are never given his name here in the Moses stories, but we have the names of two midwives. You find that interesting? Two midwives whose names have been preserved for 3,200 years, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them sitting on the birthing stool, if it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, she shall live. And of course, that's really backward, isn't it? It's backward. Um, you don't need very many boys to produce a lot of babies. Uh, you need a lot of women to produce a lot of babies. So they allowed the little girls to live and they killed the boys, which is weird. I mean, if you're a cattleman, you only need one bull for a whole bunch of cows. Uh, but anyway, that's what he decreed. If it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, it's okay. But the midwives feared El. Doesn't use the name that will be given to Moses, but uses the oldest name the Hebrews had. El, El, to stand in awe of. They stood in awe of El. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the boys live. 
So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And allowed the boys to live. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. It's not our fault. They're, they're saying, it's not our fault. They just have these babies so quickly we can't get there. So God dealt well with the midwives because they were not killing babies. And the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives stood in awe of God, he gave them families also. You see, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile. But let every girl live. Okay. If you find a Hebrew baby, just throw him in the Nile River and let him drown. All right. Chapter two. Now, a man from the house of Levi. And all you need to remember right now is that Levi was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. So uh, even though it's been 400 years, people still identify with their tribe, with their ancestry. And of course, eventually from this tribe of Levi will come Moses and Aaron and, and Miriam, their sister and so on, and the priests. But right now, now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him which really means to be sure nothing bad happened to him. And I want to stop just a second and remind you of something I told you with the stories about Noah. The language here in verse 3 is exactly the language in Hebrew. In the Hebrew words, it's exactly the same language to describe what Noah did when he built an ark. What he used to seal it, exactly the same words. And nowhere else in the Hebrew scriptures, in 39 scrolls, do you have this language except Noah and now Moses. And so if you want to think of it that way, when Noah and his family got into the boat and started pouring down rain, humankind and the fate of humankind was locked into that ark. And what this is saying is the future of the Israelites, their existence as a separate people is going to rest in what happens to that little ark. That in fact, Moses' mother has built a little ark. Now, you know that the Nile River swells when the winter rains come. It overflows its banks and fertilizes the lands around it greatest farming uh, in all of Egypt is along the Nile River. Okay. So it also was a place people drank from it. Some bathed in it. And this mother knew Pharaoh's daughter likes to bathe in the edge of the river. So if we put this little ark in the edge of the river and let it float with the tide, you know, with this, with the natural flow of the river. This is such a fine baby, my boy, that if Pharaoh's daughter should get a look at him, there's no way she could throw him in the river and let him drown. That's the thought here. But just in case, his older sister is supposed to watch. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket, and the word here is the same as ark. She saw the ark among the reeds, you know, the kind of things that grow along marshy river banks. Uh, papyrus plants grew there. The pulpy inner portion of those reeds were made into writing material, as you recall. Okay. <clears throat> she saw the ark among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister, the one who's been following him along his path down this portion of the river, 
the sister who's been watching to be sure that nothing happened to this little ark suddenly injects herself into the conversation. Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Assuming right away she cannot possibly kill this precious baby. But she didn't want to be too troubled by this baby. I knew a woman who could nurse him for you. And of course, the one she gets is her own mother, his own mother as well. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Notice his name hasn't been mentioned yet. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me. I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And she, the Pharaoh's daughter, here is the antecedent of this pronoun. And Pharaoh's daughter took him as her son. And she named him Moses. Because she said, I drew him out of the water. And it's an Egyptian word that has that meaning. Okay. I drew him out of the water. Okay. So we have long years pass. Verse 11. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people. And his people, of course, are the Israelites. He's been raised in the palace of Pharaoh. But his mother, who nursed him, has told him who he really is. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. Now, let me remind you, if, if you've missed these last couple of cold Sundays, icy Sundays, let me remind you that anthropologists have tried to figure out where the name Hebrew came from. Okay, It's used right here. Where did that come from? And the closest they can find in searching Egyptian, ancient Egyptian texts, is a name that is more of Aberu. Aberu. But it has a rough breathing mark on the front of it, sort of, sort of, sort of a Aberu, which scholars think may have become Hebrew over time. And the Aberu were talked about in Egyptian engravings the way gypsies are talked about across Europe. They were poor white trash, if you would. That's sort of the parlance. They were the poor white trash. And so the name probably was used in derision at first. It's the way the Egyptians spoke of them, the Haberu, who are making all their brick, whom many scholars believe put up the pyramids, uh, the great burial places of the Egyptians. Much of that work probably done by by Israelite or Hebrew slaves. The name was probably used in derision at first. OK. Um, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked this way and that uh, left and right. Seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand, buried him. But when he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting and he said to one who was in the wrong, why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? Now, they're mad. They're fighting. They're angry. You sort of lose control in a moment like that, you know, rush of adrenaline. So he screams out, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you kill the Egyptian? Oh, no, somebody saw it. Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. So somebody has seen it. Story spreads. Pharaoh hears about it. He's going to deal with Moses over this. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. Okay, (coughs) follow me here. It's a very small little map I have. Maybe we should do bigger. All right. This is going to become very important. We have the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Uh, There's no Jerusalem yet, but it will be here. There is a Jericho and it's there. Um, South and, and west, you have the Negev. It's sometimes spelled with a V, sometimes with a B. Farther over this way, you have the Sinai Desert. And, of course, down here, you have 
a little long here. Let's just put, if you would, the Mediterranean. And remember, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan is only 50 miles, not far. When Jesus came from Nazareth to be baptized by John, he walked 80 miles. 80 miles. Okay, so down here, you, you know, you have the Suez Canal nowadays, and over this way, you have Egypt. Now, remember when we were talking about Joseph's brothers throwing him down in a well, they're going to kill him, and then they see this caravan headed for Egypt. Why don't we sell him? We get rid of him, and we make some money too, so they haul him out of the well and sell him. And Scholars believe that this is where J and E bump up against each other again, because in three or four verses there, you're told he was sold to the Ishmaelites. He was sold to the Midianites. He was sold to the Ishmaelites. He was sold to the Midianites. So we think, you know, North South had two different words for who actually took him down to Egypt, who bought him from the brothers and took him and sold him. You remember to Potiphar sold him strictly dealt with Joseph as a slave. Okay, if in fact they were Ishmaelites, and that would be descendants of Abraham's son through the slave girl Hagar. And all of the Islamic world today claims they are descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. Other, either north or south, said, no, no, it was the Midianites, Midianite caravan that took him. It's not terribly important to you and me. What is important is that perhaps Joseph was sold to Midianites, who then sold him to Potiphar. And now Moses flees for his life and ends up in the camp of the Midianites. 400 years later, uh, he's in the camp of the Midianites, uh, who perhaps had done a dastardly deed to Joseph so many years before. Okay. Uh, Verse 16, sorry. The priest of Midian had seven daughters. Remember, seven in in ancient time, particularly in Hebrew scriptures and so on, means wholeness, completeness, and fullness. He had seven. He had a house full. He had a tent full of daughters. He had a bunch of them. They came to draw water. Remember, drawing water was usually considered women's work. Women were drawers of water. When Jesus confronts a woman at the well, she's there to draw water by herself. That's a whole other thing. But women usually drew water, so they go down to the nearest watering hole to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. But some shepherds came and drove them away. Now, Moses was sitting there watching all this. He got up and came to their defense. He chases these shepherds off and watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Ruel, another place it says Jethro. So what do you have? J and E again, almost for sure. Northern tribes called him by one name. Southern tribes called him by another. And so all these neighbors of yours that talk about the inerrancy of Scripture, you see, they don't really know what they're talking about. What was the man's name? And you can't just simply say, well, it was Ruel Jethro or Jethro Ruel. Um, The stories got told slightly differently over hundreds of years. And when the priests, after the time of Solomon, start trying to make all these stories mesh, you end up with two names. It's not terribly important. I'm just pointing it out to you. When they returned to their father, Ruel, he said, how is it that you've come back so soon today? You couldn't water all our animals that quickly. And they said, an Egyptian helped us against the shepherds. Now notice, they do not recognize Moses for who he is. He is an Israelite. But he's been raised in the palace of Pharaoh. Haircut, demeanor, clothing, perhaps even language. Egyptian. So they assume that's what he is. An Egyptian helped us against the shepherds. Not only did he chase them away, he even drew water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, where is he? Why did you leave the man? Invite him to break bread. Now, general hospitality in desert countries 
would insist that they do that. But here is a father with a tent full of daughters and a strong man who's willing to drive away renegade shepherds to water their animals. Go find him. So Moses agreed to stay with the man. I mean, it just assumes there's dinner and conversation. And Ruel says, I could really use a good man like you. I mean, I got seven daughters here. Could use a little help. OK, I'll stay with you. And since he agreed to do that, he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah in marriage. She bore a son and he named him Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. Now, after a long time, we're not told exactly how long the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to El. El heard their groaning and El remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. El looked upon the Israelites and El took notice of them. Now, I want you to stop and think with me again. Do you think these were the first Israelites who had cried out to God? I don't think so. So it's not that God is just now hearing that there's a problem in Egypt. Why did he wait 400 years? I don't have that answer. Nobody else has that answer. Why did he let communism dominate Eastern Europe? Uh, why such a strong Soviet empire for so long? And then in 1989, God said, uh, that's enough of that. Why did he allow folks even in this country to trade other folks, black folks, sell them for so long? And even a hundred years after they had been technically freed, in the South, at least, they couldn't drink from the same watering fountain as most of us. Couldn't stay in the same hotel as most of us. Couldn't eat in the same restaurants as most of us. And then in the mid-60s, God said, that's enough of that. I don't know why he waits and waits and waits. He's so patient, hoping people will help work these things out. But if they don't get it done, sooner or later, God said, that's enough. And so when we have these little songs about he has no hands but our hands, he has no feet but our feet, he has no mouths but our mouths. That's true to a point. That's true to a point. But if you and I withhold our hands and our feet and our mouths, he will find a way. If not us, then somebody else. He will find a way. So it's been 400 years, but God's finally ready to do something about that. Okay. so if you're reading this late at night, that's supposed to make you turn the page, turn the page. What's he going to do? Well, Moses was keeping the flock of his father in law, Jethro. What? I thought his name was Ruel. Well, no, this group of. Storytellers gathered around a different campfire had the name Jethro. They're sure it was Jethro. The priest of Midian. Well, they agreed on that part. Priest among the tribe of Midianites. Moses, it means the he here is not uh, antecedent, uh, not, does not have as its antecedent Jethro, but Moses. It's Moses who led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And here we say, uh, Mount what? Because here again, you see, J and E disagree. One called the mountain Horeb and one called the mountain Sinai. Same mountain. Same mountain. Two different words. So when you read in the Hebrew scriptures, you may find it written one way one time and one way the next. It's talking about the same mountain. It is Sinai. It is Horeb. The mountain of El. There the angel of, and look here. Oh, we have the name even before Moses gets the name. Lord, remember, translates the name that Moses would get at the burning bush. So the storyteller goes ahead and tells you 
Who's going to make the bush burn and not be consumed even before Moses knows the name? So follow along here what, what, what it says in Hebrew. There the angel of the I am who I am appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the I am who I am saw that he had turned aside to see. If I were preaching on this right now, you see, that would be very important. Moses turned aside to see. He didn't ignore the burning bush. He got closer. He moved in. God noticed that, observed that. When he saw he had turned aside, El called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. He said, here I am. He said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground, set apart, holy, set apart. Now, notice this is very important in other religions. We have visited a number of mosques over the years. And when you are about to enter a mosque, you take off your shoes. If you don't, they will tell you to take off your shoes or go back outside. Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And then El says further to him, I am the El of your father. Moses' father, we're not told his name. We're not told Moses' father. We're not even given the name of his mother so far. No, just I am the El of your father, however. I am the El of Abraham, the El of Isaac, the El of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at El, even if it's just appearing to him as a burning bush. Then the I am who I am said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. That is, God is omniscient, remember. Omni in Greek means all. And that second part that we would normally pronounce as science uh, means he knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's present in all places is the point. So I've seen them. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And notice the word broad land. What does that mean? It means that when you are enslaved, your world is made smaller and smaller. And when you are free, your world is bigger and bigger. When you go into a cell in a concentration camp, solitary confinement, no light, no light, Dr. Martin Niemöller and many others confined. He didn't know how long. He ended up being 42 days and nights. Not a ray of light. A little cup of water before sun up. A little cup of water after sundown. A little piece of bread each day. And a demand that he recant what he had preached against Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. He would not. When you are enslaved, whether it's sin or whatever, you have fewer and fewer options, fewer and fewer options. When you are free, you have more and more. Is an education about more options, more options. You can be anything. You can do anything. You can open any door. You see, that's what this word's about in Hebrew. I want to. Bring them up from Egypt to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, remember that poor people were fortunate if they had a goat or two, almost rich if they had 10 or 12. 
But they didn't eat them. By and large, they didn't eat them. They needed them to produce milk. And milk could be used for butter and for cheese and so on. And in their diet, there was almost no sugar. Nothing sweet. And when you were fortunate enough to come up on bees and honey, it was a great day. When I was a boy, I, I did not grow up having candy very much. We just didn't have the money. Some of you grew up that way. Uh, in World War II, when I was a little bitty fella, uh, we had to go live with my mother's parents. The gas company my dad had worked for put us out of the company house. Uh, they took him back when the war was over, but while he, while he was gone, we had to get out. And my, my grandparents on my mother's side, I told you, were sharecroppers, and that's what they were. They lived in a house that belonged to somebody else, owned land that belonged to somebody else, and farmed for half of what they could produce. It was so cold. The little natural gas company house had free natural gas. Not central heat, of course. Space heaters with gas flames this big, but you didn't get cold. We moved to my grandmother and grandfather's house, and they had no gas. No electricity. They heated the house with a fireplace and they cooked on a wood burning stove and they drew water out of a well and you went to an outhouse when you needed to. So cold, so cold. Uh, Even when my dad got back from the war and we got to move back into this very modest little company house. I remember how excited the men who worked for that little natural gas company would get when they found a bee tree. When they were staking out a new location for a well or just tending the well and they would see bees, they would follow. They'd find in a hollow tree a beehive. And I remember as a boy how exciting that was. And they would make smoking torches and smoke the bees out. And if they had to, cut down the tree to get that, that honey out of that tree. Because they didn't have much sweet in their diet. So you and I hear a land of milk and honey, and we may go, eh. But milk and honey was as good as it got. If you had milk, butter, cheese, honey, that's about as good as it got. I want to take them, Moses, from this land of enslavement, where their options have been narrowed and narrowed to a broad land where there's milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, The Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, all those tribal groups you see that lived in what we know today as Israel. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I've seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come. Come, Moses. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites. Notice God doesn't call them Hebrews. Now, nowadays, They don't consider Hebrew a defaming word. But this leads anthropologists to think as well that perhaps it was first used as a term of derision. The Abiru. Uh, Gypsies, if you would. Gypsies. Poor white trash would be a comparable kind of thing. Um, God calls them Israelites. Descendants of the one whose name he changed at the Jabbok River from Jacob, the grabber, to Israel. Bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, he's the he in the next sentence, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship El on this very mountain. I'm going to make this happen. I'm ready to make this happen. Okay, verse 13. Everybody all right? But Moses said to El, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the El of your ancestors has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, here scholars believe that what Moses is, is dealing with is the the great number of names used by these various tribal groups in the Middle East that were so similar. 
The Egyptians usually called him Ra, okay, Ra, and from that you get Ramesses. But in Canaan, we know that tribal groups sometimes called him Al, A-L, which is carried over into Islam as Allah. Some more of an I-L sound, Il, and some more of an E-L sound, El. And so Moses is saying, in effect, all these people screaming out. I don't know if you ever watch the news where it, when, when there's great tragedy in the Middle East or great celebration, how the women uh, vibrate the little uvula in the top of their mouths. and go, la, 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 la. Have you ever seen that? They do it when they're really sad and when they're really happy. And it's a cry out to God, if you would. And I've told you this before, too. The L, 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 L is Yahweh, which is shortened form of the I am who I am, became for us Alleluia over the centuries. Just a sideline. All free. Okay. If they say, what is his name? What shall I say to them? I mean, if you met him at the burning bush and he sent you here, how do we know? How do we know? You're not just some, you know, fly by nighter here. So El said to Moses, Eye Asher Eye, which is usually translated, I am who I am. But it's an unusual form of the verb to be, and it could be, I will be who I will be, or even, I am becoming who I am becoming. That's my name. He said further, this is God, thus you shall say to the Israelites, Eye Asher Eye has sent me to you. Now, El also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the I am who I am, the El of your ancestors, the El of Abraham, the El of Isaac, the El of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name the I am who I am, forever. And this, my title, for all generations. And later, of course, in the Gospels, when Jesus says, particularly in John's Gospel, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the light, I am the vine, I am the bread, that it's definitely allusioning to the name given to Moses, the burning bush. The one who is at the burning bush is the one who's present in Mary's child, Jesus. Okay, let's skip down to verse 19. Let's skip a little here. I know, however, this is still God talking, that the king of Egypt, we know him as Pharaoh, but it's just the Egyptian word for king, will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. God's saying, I'm not naive about this. I know Pharaoh. And he will not let you go just by your telling him I sent you. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will perform in it. After that, he will let you go. And in effect, God is saying, I'm going to visit plague upon plague upon Egypt. If Pharaoh gets the point after plague one, fine. If he doesn't, we'll do number two, three, four, five, six, however long it takes. But sooner or later, he will blink. You be ready to go when he does. All right. Chapter four. Then Moses answered, but suppose they do not believe me or listen to me, but say the I am who I am did not appear to you. In other words, you're fibbing, you're lying. The I am who I am said to him, what is that in your hand? Moses said, a staff. Staff was a long and crooked stick they used to pull the little animals closer to themselves. And God said, throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground and it became a snake. Moses drew back from it. Then the I am who I am said to Moses, reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and grasped it and it became a staff in his hand. Just in case Moses hadn't gotten the point yet, go to verse 6. Again, the I am who I am said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. 
So Moses put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous, white as snow. Then El said, put your hand back into your cloak. Now, everybody knew in those days you don't get close to anything leprous, so you put this horrible-looking thing, white, leprous, back inside your robe. He put it back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. Leprosy came and went in the twinkling of an eye. Even so, Moses isn't convinced. Verse 10. But Moses said to the I am who I am. Oh, my, I am who I am. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech, slow of tongue. Some think he might have been a stutterer. Then the I am who I am said to him, who gives speech to mortals? Is it not I, the I am who I am? Now go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But Moses said, oh, my, I am who I am. Please, please send somebody else. Then the anger of the I am who I am was kindled against Moses. Remember, I told you in past years that the expression in Hebrew for anger is fire in the nose. Fire in the nose. And since God's nose is bigger than everybody else's, he's really slow to anger. But when he does, you better stand back. It's like a dragon at that point, a dragon. And if you watch the British comedies on OETA late on Sunday nights, you occasionally hear them say, that really gets up my nose. Have you heard that? They still use the expression. That really gets up my nose. So God's anger. Kindle, this is the word for making a fire. The fire is beginning to grow in God's nose here. He said, well, what of your brother Aaron, the Levite? Now, they're both Levites, of course. I know that he can speak fluently. Look at verse 16. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. Verse 17. Take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. Verse 20. So Moses took his wife and his sons, put them on a donkey, and went back to the land of Egypt. Now here is a very different Moses who had left years before with all the finery of Pharaoh, fleeing across the desert. And he comes back the way Jesus will ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, on a burro. He knows Pharaoh has hundreds and hundreds of charioteers. He comes with a wife and little boys riding on donkeys. Okay. So Moses took his wife and his sons, put them on a donkey, and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses carried the staff of God in his hand. Verse 27. The I am who I am said to Aaron, this is Moses' brother, of course, go into the wilderness. Remember, wilderness is another word in Hebrew for desert. They say wilderness, they always mean desert. Go into the desert to meet Moses. So he went and he met him at the mountain of God. What would that be? Horeb, no Sinai, no Horeb. Well, you get the point. Met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Verse 30. Aaron spoke all the words that the I am who I am had spoken to Moses and performed the signs in the sight of the people. Chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the I am who I am, the El of Israel, let my people go. Verse 2, Pharaoh said, who is the I am who I am that I should heed him and let Israel go? I do not know the I am who I am, and I will not let Israel go. Verse 6, that same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people as well as their supervisors. You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as before. The people made the bricks, but... Egyptians furnish the straw. Today we put steel, of course, into concrete to reinforce it and so on. Well, they didn't have steel, and then so they put straw, and it helped hold the clay together as it dried. Straw had been provided. Well, guess what? 
Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But you shall require of them the same quantity of bricks as they've made previously. Do not not diminish it. They're lazy. They're lazy. It's amazing how we ascribe to people we don't like. When I was a young minister right out of seminary at Memorial Drive Church in Houston, I got to know our custodian very well. We just had one when I went there. It was a young church and growing. First name was Cleveland. Cleveland Bean. He'd served time in prison for killing a man at a poker game. He said it was self-defense. They made him serve eight years and let him out. He really was trying hard to come back. And he was really good. He was good with names and the people came to love him very much. Uh, late in the afternoons, when it was time for him to go, he'd wait for a bus. He got off at 5 and the bus would leave at about 5.30. It would come down Memorial Drive and he could get on. So from 5 to 5.30, he and I played ping pong. He was a really good player, had quick hands. We'd play ping pong and then he'd get on the bus to go home and I'd go home to my family. Finally, the church got big enough to hire another custodian. And uh, they decided to hire an Hispanic And Cleveland got me off to one side and said, I will watch him very closely. You know, they'll steal anything. And I thought, oh, boy, how many years have people said this about you just because you're black? And now you're saying this about him just because he's brown. But that's what we do to folks in that we demonize them to a point. Well, you know how lazy they are. Be sure they make as many brick as before, but don't supply the straw. This is the new task. You've got to get straw and make the same number of brick. Verse 15. Our Bishop Hayes has a great sermon I've heard him preach about having to make bricks without straw. Uh, another one of his is Moses looked at this stick in his hand and thought, I'm going to take on Pharaoh with this stick. And the bishop said, all my life, God has called me to a big fight with a short stick. He's a good preacher, as you know, very good preacher. Verse 12. So the people scattered throughout the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, complete your work. The same daily assignment as when you were given straw. Verse 15, then the Israelite supervisors came to Pharaoh and cried, why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks. Look how your servants are beaten. You're unjust to your own people. And he said, you're lazy. Lazy. Verse 18, go now and work for no straw shall be given you, but you shall still deliver the same number of bricks. The Israelite supervisors saw that they were in trouble when they were told you shall not lessen your daily number of bricks. As they left Pharaoh, they came upon Moses and Aaron, who were waiting to meet them. Just the two they wanted to see. And they said to them, the I am who I am. Look upon you and judge. You have brought us into bad odor with Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. That sword is, you see, if we don't make as many brick and now we have to gather straw before we can even make them. And then Moses turned again to the I am who I am and said, oh, I am who I am. Why have you mistreated this people? Why did you ever send me? Chapter six. Then the I am who I am said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. So God is saying, you think I'm not serious? I'm serious. Pharaoh thinks I'm not serious. I'm serious. We've tried it the easy way. Now we will do it the harder way. All right, let's go on. Verse 10. Then the I am who I am spoke to Moses. Go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his hand. But Moses spoke to the I am who I am. The Israelites have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? Poor speaker that I am. Chapter seven, verse four. 
When Pharaoh does not listen to you, this is God speaking, of course, I will lay my hand upon Egypt and bring my people. He doesn't call them Hebrews. He calls them Israelites company by company out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Once again, I'm serious. I'm serious, Moses. I'm asking you to be serious. And I'm telling Pharaoh he better be serious. Okay, we're going to have to stop. I'm going to put down next week. We start with Exodus 7, verse 8. If you haven't been to church, don't rush off. I'll be right back.